Well, hello and welcome to the podcast from the Huffines Institute for Sports Medicine and Human Performance. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Lightfoot, and I'm so glad that you took the time to join us today. We're starting a new series uh, with this podcast where we're going to focus on the history of exercise physiology, particularly in the United States. We're at a point in time where a generation of exercise physiologists that were of the first and second generation of exercise physiologists ever are starting to retire. And so I thought it was important for us to take time to talk about those individuals, to talk to those individuals where we can, and talk about how they have contributed to what we now know as sports medicine and human performance. And so kicking off our series today is a longtime colleague of mine, someone I'm very pleased to be able to talk to, uh, Dr. Sue Bloomfield. Uh, Sue, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Glad to be here. We're so glad to have you. I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about you, and then we'll just jump off into the conversation. Many of you may, may remember we interviewed Sue way back on the podcast. I believe it was number six back in 2011. So she was one of our early guests. Uh, again, like I said, a longtime colleague of mine here at Texas A&M. Currently, Dr. Bloomfield is a professor emeritus here. She got her bachelor's degree from Oberlin College. She got her master's degree in physical education from the University of Iowa her PhD in exercise physiology from The Ohio State University. Uh, she was at Texas A&M from 1993 until in 2020. She has so many awards, it would take me uh, the whole length of the podcast to actually talk about them. But in particular, she was a fellow, she's a fellow of the Col American College of Sports Medicine. She's a fellow of the National Academies of Kinesiology. She has uh, had research funding by the Department of Defense from NASA and from the, NASA, from the National Space Board Research Institute. She was funded most of her career doing space research in the area of bone, which was our conversation topic of the last podcast we did with her. Uh, when Dr. Bloomfield retired here from Texas A&M, she retired as the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Education and Human Development. And again, one of my longtime colleagues and uh, someone that I enjoy talking to quite a bit about these kind of issues, Dr. Bloomfield. And Dr. Bloomfield, like I said, we're so glad to have you on. And we're going to talk today primarily about two individuals that you interacted with that have been were so instrumental in the founding of exercise physiology. And we're going to start with one, Dr. Carl Gisolfi. So tell us what you didn't remember about Dr. Gisolfi. Okay, well, for some context, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I trained with Carl Gisolfi at the University of Iowa uh, for three years. Originally, it was looking like I would do a PhD, but uh, life intervened, and for personal reasons, I, I, I finished off after three years with a master's degree. And so... Um, I, I wasn't, I only had those three years with him, but they were very formative years and I have some chief um, key memories of that time. And in fact, um, an interesting side bit, I, I owe my career to this man essentially because he pulled me back into the graduate program after I had left for non-academic reasons after just one semester, long different story, another time. But he pulled me back in and um, I ended up in a career I've loved in a discipline that's, I think, fascinating. Uh, a little background on Carl DeSalfi, very interesting fellow. He grew up in New York City. He was a very talented track athlete. Um, he competed in college there in New York City and was quite competitive, um, pretty much national level. Decided to go on with graduate work in um, exercise physiology and trained with Sid Robinson at the University of Indiana. And I believe was Sid Robinson's first PhD um, advisee. Interestingly, his lineage can be traced right back to D.B. Dill because Sid Robinson was the first PhD graduate of um, for, under D.B. Dill. Well, and, that, and that's an important, I, I'm, I'm jumping in here, but that's an important point because D.B. Deal is considered by many to be the founding father of exercise physiology in the United States. Exactly. He was with the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory, which was founded, I think, pre-World War II and was a really important um, generator of um, physiologists interested in both work physiology, which the military was interested in, and what morphed into what we now call exercise physiology or exercise science. Yes, so he was a key figure himself. 
So that makes you that makes you four generations away from DBD. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you count masters students. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, um, so I I believe Jasalfi's dissertation work, which was in temperature regulation, with Sid Robinson's area, was the first his dissertation study, I believe, was the first to demonstrate that endurance training, even in thermo neutral environments, um, contributed some important acclimation towards exercising in the heat. In other words, endurance trained individuals demonstrated um, more efficient sweat responses and better tolerance of heat than untrained individuals. Um, um, and I believe even if those untrained individuals had been exposed to some heat stress. So it's a whole real interesting area, um, the, the history of temperature regulation research. Um, I was really grateful to get exposed to that. And I think it's a critical area in our discipline because, you know, it really relates to the safety of exercise in the heat. Um, and some years later, I believe Jasalfi helped generate to my memory, what it was the first position stand published by ACSM, which was on fluid replacement during exercise, particularly in the heat, um, which has undergone several revisions. But it was um, an important step for ACSM to, to jump in the arena of publishing these well-supported, well-documented position stands taking a, a, um, uh, on important issues. And, Given that uh, um, deaths during you know, prolonged exposure in the heat, during, especially during long races back in the day, this is back in the, I think, late 70s or early 80s, um, we're still a serious, well, it is still a serious issue, but, but more of a problem back then, before the research really came on board to demonstrate um, <clears throat> the critical importance of fluid replacement and the advantage of certain beverages with electrolytes and so forth. I mean, it was, it was uh, an important um, uh, position stand to get out there. And some of that work, I think, led to Jasalfi's work with my doctoral advisor, uh, David Lamb, in working with the Gatorade Institute, and they created these yearly um, conferences, right, on a a different topic and, and then ended up publishing a book each year. Um, I can't remember the exact title. I can picture it in my mind, a whole stack of blue volumes I used to have. Perspectives in Exercise Medicine, I think, uh, something of that sort of exercise science. And um, um, so a different topic each year. And I had the privilege of being invited to contribute to one of those many, many years later. Like, so pe uh, I think people forget that uh, our, our time has moved really quickly for folks that they forget that, you know, the amount of people that are running or have run or run for exercise really started to increase in the 70s, especially with the publication of Jim Fix's book, yes. the running book. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't a lot known about running and endurance and thermal regulation responses. And so Carl Gisalfi was on the forefront of learning about all that, not only for the military, but for, uh, for recreational athletes as well. Absolutely. So yeah. it's interesting. Let me share a few personal memories of Dr. Gisalfi, as he will always be in my memory. Um, although some years later, I was his colleague. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, I entered this graduate program at the young age of 23 as many graduate students do, and was a little bit intimidated. You know, both he and Charles Tipton, the leaders of this program at University of Iowa, were had a reputation, right? It, this was one of the premier programs at the time in exercise physiology, known to be rigorous, known for a number of students washing out. <laughs> I mean, if you didn't get a B or better in certain courses, um, you were out. So it was it was a very high standard program. Um, but of course, for those of us who survived those <laughs> courses and moved on, it, it meant we had excellent training. And um, so it my, my memories as a student, you know, of our of Dr. Gisalfi are is a, a somewhat gruff, but in a pinch, he could be very understanding and um, supportive 
absolutely supportive of his students. Um, he and Tipton both, I think, were among the um, early professors in their era, right, who felt strongly that you should get your students to professional meetings, that they should be publishing their dissertation work. That wasn't standard back in the day. And even encouraging their graduates to go on for postdoctoral work, which back in the 70s, early 80s was not routine for exercise science uh, graduates. Um, he was doing largely human experimental work when he first moved to Iowa in, I believe, 1969. So I got there in 1975 and he was kind of finishing out that phase of his career, but I, I still had the opportunity then to learn how to run VO2 max tests and so forth, which were a very different animal in those days. And in fact, I had the opportunity to learn how to use a show lander device. And for, for th those of you under 55 years of age, a show lander device was a, um, a, an ingenious, mechanical device used to um, with exquisitely blown glassware which you would use to measure the oxygen content and then the co2 content in a small sample of expired air that you would introduce into this glassware very carefully and then with a series of maneuvers measure the changes in volume as the o2 got absorbed by one fluid and the co2 got absorbed by another fluid so, and, and we put a picture up that we just flash that picture up. I've got actually I've got that show lander in my sitting in my office right oh, now. Do you? Yeah. Well, you yeah. can add it to your podcast or your video cast. But it was so it meant that to get results, I mean, to, to get the final result after a VO2 max test took several hours <laughs> after the completion of the test. Um, and, and I actually was. Um, it was a skill that I was asked to use a few years later when I moved on to a research job in John Halsey's research labs in St. Louis. And they needed someone to do that because that's what we used to calibrate or to double check the tanks of gas, right? That you got commercially. So you checked the exact pre, uh, precise, you know, concentrations of O2 and CO2 in your calibration tanks, which were used with the then very new electronic devices that might be used to during those tests. So, um, but but during my second year, um, I Giuseppe was turning to more mechanistic um, work with both primates and rodents, you know, to look at the role of the anterior pituitary in temperature regulation. And so, I got my first taste of live animal research and learned how to do stereotaxic surgery because we were in, you know, inserting substances straight into the anterior pituitary. It was it was challenging work. Um, so it uh, he, but I really think he's best known um, in our field for his major contributions to our knowledge about temperature regulation and exercise in the heat. He was uh, quite an accomplished scholar. He and he reached one of his main goals. Uh, of, he he um, was elected president of American College of Sports Medicine in 1985. Later, he received the Citation Award, the Honor Award, numerous other awards, um, and, and was remained a very productive scholar even in the, the 90s. After he had been diagnosed with a progressive fatal disease, he continued to work and was very productive, um, um, regularly publishing. I, I had a chance to interact with him in the early 90s as a colleague because that was my first position right before I came to Texas A&M. I had a one year visiting assistant professorship at University of Iowa. And you can imagine how intimidating it might be to come back, even though I'd been gone, what, 18 years, <laughs> um, to come back and interact as a colleague with your former professors. So that was that was an interesting um, challenge, but uh, an experience I was very grateful for. And uh, um, I remember Carl, now I could learn to call him Carl, which was not an easy step, um, had purchased it, oh, spent a small fortune on one of these ergonomic reclining chairs for his office so that he could take cat naps during the workday and, and prolong his ability to work. Um, so it was a really sad day in 2000 when he passed away and um, had a 
relatively young age, and um, we really lost one of the giants in temperature regulation research. And but we don't forget him because that the the fun run at the American College of Sports meeting oh, yeah. meeting is named after Carl Josalfi. And that was one of the reasons I'm so glad we talked about him because I'm sure there are many people that go to that meeting that go, they know nothing about Carl Josalfi. And uh, so he was one of the ones that had institutionalized that fun run and they certainly named it after him for, to, to, for those memories. So you were very blessed when you were at Iowa to not only to interact with Dr. Josalfi, but also to interact with another giant in our field. And you've mentioned a couple times uh, Dr. Charles Tipton. Exactly. Um, Tipton was the one who founded the program there at University of Iowa. I think it was 1963. And um, he he was appointed in the Department of Physical Education, right? which was its name at that time. But he made the PhD program an interdisciplinary program involving many departments in the School of Medicine there, including anatomy, pharmacology, um, a science department in the University of Physiology and Biophysics. And he, he built it into one of the premier programs. Remember, this in the 60s and 70s, our field, exercise physiology, exercise science, was still quite young, and there weren't that many um, programs to choose from. And this really was one of the more rigorous programs at the time. Um, so Josafi joined him, you know, a few, later in the decade, and the two of them built this into quite a program. Um, so because they were the two physiologists in the department, really any advisee of Tipton or Josafi had the other professor as your kind of co-mentor because we worked with um, both quite closely. Um, I remember as a young graduate student being first thrilled because I loved this new discipline I just discovered, you know, a year or two previously before I applied, um, fit me to a T. So Tipton was my professor for my very first exercise physiology course in graduate school. And no matter what topic we embarked on over the semester, the first thing he worked all of us through was a short history lesson on who were the first researchers in this area. And to this day, I can remember his booming voice. We must know on whose shoulders we stand. <laughs> and, and many of you may be aware of his um, um, books, I think published by American College of Sports Medicine, that detail the history of exercise physiology. So later in his life, he became kind of one of our unofficial historians, and I commend those books to your reading. Um, so yeah, it was a great um, advantage of being a student in this relatively small program. I don't remember more than about maybe 10 students total at most at a time. Um, when I was there in the mid 70s, I was one of just two women in the program. More came in later, uh, happily. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was a huge advantage because you would often get semi involved in studies in both research labs, or at least be aware of what's going on because your friends were working on projects XYZ with Tipton and they would know about projects with um, Josafi's lab. So um, Tipton always emphasized a mechanistic approach to research, you know, that, you know, we're physiologists first. And our goal is to understand the underlying mechanisms, not just to describe the phenomena. And to do that, boy, you, you, you um, there was a rigorous list of coursework <laughs> to take. Um, my particular nemesis was physical chemistry. Um, that was a, a tough one, but, um, again, for those who survived all this coursework, you were really well prepared to go on in a career in physiology. Um, and so a, he, he, he moved, he transitioned from Iowa, uh, yes. to university of Arizona where he became department chair. And I believe in the 1990s, mid -80s. Mid -80s. Mid -80s. yeah. Yes, so he spent, um, gosh, probably the first 20 20ish years at University of Iowa and then moved to University of Arizona. And to this day, there are still 
reunion dinners at ACSM every year, uh, tagged Iowa, Arizona, and Washington <laughs> um, reunions because it was generated by Tipton and um, um, Phil Galnick at University of Washington. And once Tipton moved to Arizona, it was expanded beyond Iowa, Washington to include Arizona. But yes, he spent many productive years there. You know, what, what's really remarkable about Charles Tipton was the breadth of his expertise. Um, and I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to put a short plug in here for a special symposium that will be held at this year's American College of Sports Medicine meeting on Thursday morning, honoring Charles Tipton and his contributions to science, but also kind of a forward looking um, perspective on exercise science. Yeah, and I'm glad you're saying that because I was going to mention that later that this is because oh, okay. Dr. Tipton left us recently and it's uh, going to yes, be a, a great memoriam for him. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in, um, and I'm, I'm honored to be one of the speakers at this symposium along with Mike Joyner and Frank Booth. And so I've been prepping towards that and in reviewing his CV, my gosh, um, this man had expertise in cardiovascular physiology. He published several huge review papers on exercise and hypertension, um, pulmonary function, connective tissue, even a few papers on bone adaptations, um, real niche area, microgravity physiology. Um, and he also got involved in one key applied physiology area, that of weight loss in wrestlers. You may know Iowa was huge on the wrestling scene, especially in that era. And um, the sometimes dangerous practices wrestlers take to, to lose weight rapidly for um, to, to make certain weight class before competitions um, were quite dangerous, actually. And so that led to a position stand that I think Tipton had a key hand in on weight loss and wrestlers. And um, some of his um, advisees have carried that on on several revisions of that position stand. Um, I ran in, I, I had the pleasure of interacting with Tipton years later um, after I'd moved to Texas A&M and then was actively involved in some leadership activities within National Space Biomedical Research Institute. Turns out Charles Tipton was on their external advisory board and he had to be in his late seventies by then. Um, he was a, he, he, he famously retired quote unquote several times um, from the University of Arizona, but really kept quite active in consulting advisory boards of this sort. Um, so he, I, I, I have distinct memories of listening to him champion over and over the critical role integrative physiology plays in understanding human adaptations to microgravity and how we need to understand these key issues in particular with say muscle and bone loss or cardio changes in cardiovascular function. Um, he, he, he could carry on in his curmudgeonly way with flair <laughs> into his eighties. <80s. laughs> so he, um, um, was a real champion for our discipline in the larger group of disciplines that were gathered at the table and, um, and had remarkable, <laughs> um, in-depth knowledge across a variety of, of systems, which is rare, very rare these days, right? Because most of us have to focus on our niche area. Um, I, I had some dealings with Dr. Tipton and uh, in the 90s, in the 90s and the early 2000s. And it was intimidating, as much like you talked about with Dr. Gisalfi earlier. It was intimidating, but uh, it, it was also, um, you listened because he had seen it all and done it all. Yeah. And, um, and so it was fun to fun to have those conversations with him. Exactly. Um, there's another side of him that um, I want to make sure we I share, and that is of um, this is this is man as a professor even in the '60s and '70s he would hold a yearly Christmas party for all the faculty and graduate students in the program. He would throw his house open and. The curmudgeon professor was gone and in its place was this boisterous, wonderful host. So happy to see you. 
come on in. And it was, it was a wonderful insight into his, um, his family and his personality. And he, as I think alluded to earlier, convened for years at ACSM. He was the head convener of this reunion group of former graduate students from University of Iowa, Arizona, and Washington and um would reign as mc i think i think it was the highlight of his year every year <laughs> and he would always remind all of us with deep emotion in his voice you know uh after we'd gone around the table and each provided some personal update he said nothing about your professional career something about your personal life what's what's happened this year and he would always remind us Remember, this is your family. These are people who care about you. Take care of each other. Watch out. <laughs> so he he um, was a remarkable mentor, but also um, colleague and uh, general su supporter of all of us. And, and the list of his graduates are a who's who. I mean, I couldn't even start to name them all. Some of the uh, more renowned are Frank Booth, Ken Baldwin, Ron Tre Young, um, Jack Young, many others. Um, and I, I hope you have the chance someday to interview one of his PhD advisees, because I'm sure they could provide many more good stories. But um, I think our own Chris Woodman was one of his PhD advisees, was he? I believe so, at University of Arizona. He might have been one of his last doctoral students. Yeah, and so we'll, we'll get Dr. Woodman on to talk about Dr. That'd tip be a great idea. Because he's talked about TIP before quite a bit. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, but it's amazing. And I, Sue, I think the question we need to talk about briefly here is that uh, as a woman in the early 70s, as you mentioned, you were one of the few women in the field. Um, how did, uh, were you treated well? Were you supported? It sounds like you were supported. I. But I think that's something that we need to ask about these giants and to how, they, how they promoted women. I know many of the giants in our field have promoted women, and now we have a plethora of, of, of females in, the, in this business. Um, what, what's your take on all that? The 1970s were a very different time. <laughs> I, um, I mean, for perspective, for younger listeners, this is right after Title IX had passed. You know, there was just a growing recognition of the role of women in sport, but also women in the professions. Um, but I, I, I never felt anything but support from Tipton and Gisalfi as a master's student. And later during my doctoral work, I, I worked for um, a good seven years before I decided I really did want that PhD and went back to Ohio State University. But uh, I will say there, there wasn't the sensitivity back then to some of the, um, um, gosh, I think they get labeled these days as microaggressions, you know, just the small remarks that kind of add up. But I personally, was not impacted too much by that. I had um, the key example of one senior doctoral student who was a woman. And this this woman, to my amazement, had had two children during her time as a graduate student. And I thought, oh my God, how does somebody do that? Well, Nadie Wilson was her name. She provided a role model for me because that's exactly when I had my family, when I was doing my graduate work at Ohio State. She, she showed me it could be done with the right partner. I mean, you have to have a good supportive partner, right? But um, no, I, th I think, I, think I, I was subject to the same pressures as the male students in terms of the really high standards and you have to get a B in these certain courses or, or you're out on your caboose. Um, and like I say, Jasalfi was really the one who pulled me back into the program when I might have left it for reasons that were good at the time. But but he brought me back into the program and I've been very grateful ever since. So I, um, I, I think as long as you, they were very supportive of anyone willing to work hard. So and I was willing to do that and luckily had the native skills to be a good test taker and learn well. And so it was, um, 
I think they grew, they, they started bringing in more women students in, in the 80s. And um, I'm not, I think Tipton had only one or two, but Josalfi had many more. And um, so, so yes, it was a very different era, but uh, I felt very lucky to be in that program and learn so much. <laughs> and um, it was a good springboard. Uh, although I, at the time, decided I, a career research was maybe not for me. Um, and I also had a husband in St. Louis that I was had lived apart from too long. So it was time to move on. Uh, but yeah, interestingly, life brought me back to this discipline and uh, to Salfi and Tipton too had a hand in that. Well, you know, it's, it's been great, uh, the conversation with you, Sue, and I, I'm going to ask you to come back so we can talk about your PhD mentor, who is also a giant in the field, David Lamb, as well as your postdoc supervisor, John Hollisey, and because uh, they were amazing individuals uh, in and of themselves as well. And uh, But I want to thank you for taking time to talk to us about Carl Josalfi and Charlie Tipton today. Like I said, we're going to have you back to talk about Lamb and Hollisey as well. Um, and so... As you know, at the end, we always we always give people a chance to give us a take-home message. So for the people listening to this podcast, what's the take-home message that you'd like for them to take away from this? Wow. Um, well, my personal take-home message is choose your mentors well. Um, go for the most rigorous programs, work environment you can shoot for, because I think you gain and benefit immensely. Um, in terms of Tipton's and Josalfi's examples, they were both men of deep integrity, um, incredible work ethics, and they set very high standards, you know, for all their students and colleagues and um, it can create its own stress, but in the end, um, it's it's a good way to go. And I've been forever grateful. I've kept in touch with the Iowa group, even though I wasn't technically one of their doctoral graduates, but it's a really amazing group of people. And so my other takeaway might be keep in touch with your former mentors and professors and your academic community. It's, it's not only um, good for your networking in your career, but a source of rich personal relationships. That is a great take home message. Thank you, Sue, for your time today. Absolutely, my pleasure. And thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. We hope you've enjoyed this. And like I said, we'll be back with more of these uh, looking at the history of exercise physiology. And so until next time, we hope that you have a great week, stay active and stay healthy.